Happy Sabbath once again, everybody. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Welcome to the Power Hour. Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to say welcome to you to this service because it's an opportunity to hear the word of God, but it is also an opportunity for the pastor to look into the audience and see faces he hasn't seen in a while, faces he doesn't know. So let me go ahead and say thank you for coming to worship with us today. Sister Rita, welcome back. Dr. Regina, welcome back. I see another face at the back. You're hiding, but I see you. Welcome back. God bless you. And may you enjoy the service with us today. I want you to know that we don't just meet on Saturdays. We're here on Wednesday. Tomorrow morning, we are in Ancho to pray together. I'm really excited about praying with people, so please come. Let's do that together and worship the Lord. Amen. Let me ask a question. Does anybody know what is up on the screen right now? Does anybody know what that is? Just, just raise your hand if you know what that is. Anybody? No? You guys don't know what that is? You know what that is? Nobody else? You, you have no idea what that is? You, you've never seen that online? Nobody's ever sent that to you? You've never seen the t-shirt before? Okay, here's a question. How many people think that that's a clothing label? Raise your hand. All right, he does. Who else? You do. Doctor thinks so. He's not sure now because I asked the question. He knows where I'm going with this. Who else thinks it's a label? Now, who doesn't know what it is, show by raising your hand. Who doesn't know what I'm talking about right now? <laughs> who doesn't care about what I'm talking about right now? <laughs> tough crowd, tough crowd. To be honest with you, I thought that this was a clothing label. For the longest time, I thought it was a clothing label. I thought about doing a series called Keep Calm because of this label two years ago. And I've been, I've been postponing, postponing until I decided I'm going to do the series in the month of November because I'm turning 30 years old and I need to keep calm. Okay, because 40 is right around the corner. Right? But when I looked up what this was, it was not a clothing label. In actual fact, it was a marketing strategy that the British communications department came up with in 1939 because Germany was threatening Europe and pretty much the rest of the world. The British government had to come up with something to encourage its people. And so they came up with some public campaigns to encourage the citizens that everything would be fine. They came up with some terrible ideas, but finally, one of the people in the communications office came up with this idea. And the idea was, keep calm and carry on. Keep calm and carry on. Why did they need to keep calm? Here's something that you must understand and know about Hitler. Hitler is not just known for the mass murder and genocide of Jews and believers in Germany and parts of the European countries that are around Germany. But Hitler was known for this strategy known as Blitzkrieg or lightning war. What Hitler would do is he would send hundreds of fighter jets to drop bombs on cities to annihilate them and have a victory in one day. The problem is there was no form of communication or way to know when this would happen. And so to motivate the people to keep living their lives, this message was put together. But sadly, it was never ever used. It was never used and that's why you don't know it. They intended to use it but didn't. In 2008, it started becoming popular when people were wearing it on t-shirts and that's why most of you think it is a marketing or it's a clothing label, right? This generation thinks everything is a clothing label. No, it is not. This is about war, all right? This is what the streets of London look like whenever those bombs would fall. People would be left homeless and stranded. In fact, if you look at the statistics, it says that more than 50,000 people would die but more than 2.2 million would be displaced from their homes. Can you imagine being in your house and not knowing when a bomb would fall? See, it's one thing for me to anticipate an earthquake in my apartment. It's another to anticipate a bomb. So every day you're looking up. Sometimes they would hear sirens, but the siren was too late. 
Not everybody could afford those bunkers where you could hide underground and stay safe. So people lived in constant fear. So the leaders were trying to the, say to the people, keep calm and carry on. Well, that's not the theme of my series for this month. But if you notice, if you go online right now, keep calm has become a terrible meme. Some of them are good. Some of them are not that bad. I mean, keep calm and chill. That's awesome. Keep calm, you're farty. I'm going to read that one in a couple of years. I'm going to try to keep calm. Right? Some of them get a bit tricky because it's about food. Keep calm and eat a cake. Keep calm and eat tacos. Taco Tuesday. Right? Some of them are just terrible. Look at this one. Keep calm and scare on. Keep calm and go shopping. No husband keeps calm on that one. Keep calm and smoke weed. What is wrong with millennials? What is that? But this is what has happened to the message of keep calm. So I'm here today to redeem the message back. And my series is entitled, Keep Calm. I want you to turn to somebody seated next to you and say to them, keep calm. Husbands, this is a chance to say to your wife. Wives, this is a chance to say to your husbands, keep calm. Keep calm. The message today is keep calm and live. Every week there'll be a different tag to it, keep calm and live. I was trying to think of what is equally if not as tragic as dro bombs dropping on a city and thousands of people dying at the same time. The passage of scripture I'm going to read today is, for me, it's one of the top five R-rated scriptures in the Bible. Right? One of those is Judges chapter 20. I'm not going to tell you what it's about. Go ahead and read it by yourself. The other is Ezekiel chapter 16. I'm going to read it today. An R-rated text, meaning that the contents are so gruesome that reading it is a bit embarrassing. But I'm going to do it today because I'm me. I read an article from 2017 about a youth pastor who was driving along the roads. I believe it's uh, North Carolina, if I'm not mistaken. And as they were driving, they were coming from an event with a group of children heading back to the church. And on the highway, they noticed a car seat by the side of the road. And the husband who was driving noticed the, a hand peeping out from the car seat, and so he stopped. And in the car seat, they noticed a baby sitting in the car seat in the middle of nowhere by the side of the road. And so he noticed that the baby's eyes were not opened, and he thought the baby was dead, but they stopped the car, went close, and then the wife took the child up and realized that somebody had abandoned the baby on the highway. Now, you would think they did it because they can't afford to take care of the child, but underneath they noticed that there was $5,000, a birth certificate, and a passport for the baby. So whoever the parents of this child were decided that this baby was an inconvenience, and so they left the child by the side of the road with $5,000. This couple took the child and obviously took it to the authorities. The child was taken out, and then this is where we are today. We live in a world where mothers, fathers are willing to abandon, abandon their children. They are willing to leave a child by the side of the road. In the same website, if you look at this stream of articles that you will find, there's an article that says, woman waits for one hour to rescue stray puppy. We love animals more than we love our babies. I told you a story one time that there was a, 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 a couple who was pushing their stroller next to a stream pulling their dog. And then the dog broke from the string and jumped into the river, and both parents jumped inside to save the child and let the dog and left the child on the stroller by itself. Hashtag save the planet. Let's go to the Bible. You, you, you think that's bad. It's about to get worse. Let's read the scriptures together right now. Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16. I'm going to read verse number one to verse number six. Please read it in your Bible so that you capture what is being said in the text. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse number one to verse six. I'm reading from the New Living Translation today. Then another message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, confront Jerusalem with her detestable sins. Give her this message from the sovereign Lord. 
You are nothing but a Canaanite. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. On the day that you were born, nobody cared about you. Your umbilical cord was not cut and you were never washed, rubbed with salt and wrapped in a cloth. No one had the slightest interest in you. No one pitied you or cared for you. On the day you were born, you were unwanted, dumped in a field and left to die. But I came by and saw you there, helplessly kicking about in your own blood. As you lay there, I said, live. When the Chaldeans or the Babylonians captured the Israelites, what would happen was whenever a mother would give birth during the march from Judah to uh, Babylon, the soldiers would take any newborn babies and leave them by the side of the road because they didn't want to be slowed down by mothers who had children. Sometimes even if a child was breastfeeding and the family was slowing everybody down, these soldiers were so cruel, they would take the baby and leave it by the side of the road. Now, I'm not sure if this is the intention that God had in sharing this with Ezekiel, but what I do know is that Ezekiel is an exilic prophet. What that means is, as Judah, as the people of Judah or Israel are being dragged from their homes to Babylon, Ezekiel was one of the prophets who ended up in Babylon as well. So his function as the pastor or the preacher or the prophet of the time was to speak to God's people during their years of exile. One of the messages that God gives is in Ezekiel chapter 16, and this is where we are. The little child in the story is female. Because if God is going to use an analogy of a child or a human being, it must be a woman because the woman represents uh, repro reproduction and, and, and a seed. She represents life. She represents the church. Are we together? So... This female baby is described in this chapter in the most gruesome way. And I apologize for sharing this story, especially to the mothers who are carrying a baby right now. I know you love your child way more than the people in the story did. I want you to imagine a child in its mother's womb. Doctors say, and right now I'm surrounded by a lot of doctors. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but babies can hear even in the womb. Am I correct? So you can imagine that this girl child, the first voice she heard probably uh, was her mother's. Because mothers, good mothers, love to sing to their babies. So every night she'd hear the mother's voice and sometimes the father when he humbled himself. And they would sing the Hebrew version of, do you sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star to a baby in the womb? I, I don't even remember what songs my wife sang. I think they were bass. I, I, I don't know. I was writing sermons. Um... Imagine this little baby hears the voice of her mother in the womb. Sometimes she hears mom and dad arguing and then she hears mom crying and mom puts, puts her hands on the, on the belly and she says, don't worry, no matter what happens, I got you. Now and again, when she, 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 she's excited, she would kick to let her mother know that I'm here, I'm alive and I can't wait to come out. One day she hears male voices outside and her mother's in pain, but she's the reason for that pain. All of a sudden, she starts to see the light, but the face that greets her is not the face of her father or a family member, the voices she heard. No, it's a soldier yanking her out of her mother's womb. The soldier cuts the umbilical cord that connects baby to mother, but leaves it on the child and just dumps the baby by the side of the road. The child can hear the mom screaming, but the screams become faint as the caravan keeps moving, and the child is left by the side of the road. God says that you Israel, you church, you person, you are like that baby that has been abandoned by the side of the road. And like I said, I apologize for the passage of scripture, but there's something that we can learn uh, from this text. And I want to go back to the passage and point it out to you. There are a couple of things that we can learn from a baby that is abandoned by the side of the road. In verse 4 and 5, the Bible says, no one cared about you. There was the least, not even the least, slightest interest in you. You were dumped and left for dead. Now, I imagine that nobody here, well, maybe not nobody, but the majority can safely say that when they were born, they were not born to this circumstance. 
Not everybody can say they were abandoned as a baby. There might be somebody who is an orphan and grew up not knowing their real parents, but this child's situation is something else. This child has not been left by the doorsteps of an orphanage. This child has not been left by the church steps. This child has been left in the wilderness where there are no people, but there are animals. This child is experiencing the worst kind of situation and doesn't even know what's happening. Just to help you understand, there's five things that you can see from this little girl's life that reflect sometimes what happens to us. Number one, she was an illegitimate child. What does that mean? God said, you are a Canaanite, meaning you are the offspring of an Amorite and a Hittite. All these were heathen nations. You see, sometimes as God's people, we forget that there's a history behind us. God's people were so proud about who they were, they forgot their heritage. They forgot that they came from heathens and God pulled them out of that situation. So God is reminding them that before you knew me, you were an illegitimate child. By the way, somebody said, I don't believe in illegitimate children. I believe in illegitimate parents because a child does not choose to be born. Parents decide what to do with a child. But this child is coming from a negative background because of its heritage. Number two. This child is abandoned. This child is alone. Nobody's there, no nanny, no mommy, no auntie, no papa, nothing. Just by itself, by the side of the road. And I imagine that sometimes you all feel abandoned also. That even in a crowd, even in a place like this, you feel alone. You feel like nobody's there for you. Do you realize that humanity right now feels alone? In the past 10 years, there have been more science fiction movies about going out into space and meeting aliens because we feel alone. It is in this generation that man is so interested to find life on other planets because apparently almost 8 billion people is not enough. We want more. We feel by ourselves. Okay, forget the planets. Let's talk about nations. Every country in the world cries about something. Every nation feels abandoned. Oh, there's too many of us. Everybody hates us, America. Everybody doesn't want to help us. So we're, we're starving. There's civil war. Everybody's complaining about something. Okay, forget the countries because you don't care about that. Let's talk about the races. The black people are crying racism. Asian people are crying nepotism. Oh, I'm sorry, not nepotism. They're crying that they're being abused because you're so smart and everybody loves what you know, but nobody cares about you. The Indian people are complaining about the same thing. The white man is complaining because everybody blames him for everything. Every race is complaining about something. Okay, maybe race is not the issue. Tribe is the issue. Pastor, my tribe is the minority. I cannot get a job unless I know somebody. I can't go into business because these people don't know me. Everybody feels abandoned. Maybe tribe is not your problem. Religion is your problem. You belong to a minority religion. You can't speak about what you believe anywhere you go. You have to be careful about what you talk about and what you believe. Abandoned. Maybe it's your family. You feel isolated because you don't come from a rich family. Everybody else got money. You don't have money. You look at people in church, they're wearing all these fancy clothes and these fancy shoes, and you feel like nobody. You feel abandoned. Sometimes in the family. They've given you food, they've given you a roof over your head, they've given you an education, they've provided you with all you've got. Wives, you've been given a credit card. Husbands, you've been given freedom, but you feel abandoned. And so you're sitting here in a crowded room, feeling as if nobody is there for you. I want you to know that this baby's story is the same. This child is helpless. It's a baby. It can tell pain, it can feel pain, but it doesn't know where it's coming from. It's helpless because even though it can scream, it can't get up and walk, it can't run, it can't look for food, it can't look for water. It's helpless. Do you ever feel helpless in your life? Do you ever feel like everything you're trying to do is not working out? You ask for help and nobody wants to give it. You feel alone. You feel helpless. This baby was helpless. What else? Vulnerable. When the sun beat on the child, it can cover itself. You realize that in the desert, it's hot by day and cold by night. At some point, 
the child's body, its, its organs will shut down. It will suffer pneumonia, whatever it is that people suffer from in the cold and the change of heat. It will die because it's vulnerable. Does anybody here feel vulnerable sometimes? Do you feel exposed? Do you feel like at any moment things could go bad? Do you feel like people know stuff about you that they shouldn't and they'll use it against you? You feel exposed and naked like a baby by the side of the road. It's November. Since January, you've been trying to do something to improve the quality of your life. And now it's the 2nd of November and things are worse than when it started. Hashtag the struggle is real. Maybe you feel undesirable. One of the verses says that this baby is undesirable. Who wants to pick up a baby by the side of the road with its umbilical cord still sticking out, surrounded in its own embryonic fluid and blood coming all over it? It's undesirable. Anybody here feel undesirable? Nobody wants you. Nobody wants to spend time with you. Nobody wants to go into business with you. Nobody wants to get into a relationship with you. At church, nobody talks to you. Your family members, they celebrate your sibling, but not you. You feel undesirable. Now, if I stop right now and say, let's pray and go home, would you be happy with that? I'm not happy just talking about this stuff, but it's in the Bible. God uses the most gruesome example to talk about the helplessness of humanity. This one was even worse for me. It almost made me cry because this child is kicking in its own blood. The very thing that's supposed to give it life could probably suffocate it and it could die by the side of the road. And God says, you believer, you church, you Jerusalem, that's what you were like when I came to you. But praise God, it says he passed by. He passed by. The mother abandoned the child. Isaiah says, can a mother forget her suckling baby? She could, but God will never forget his own. Even in the worst of situations, I want you to understand that one day, God will pass by. He's on his way. You may not think so. Vulnerable, abandoned, helpless, feeling as if nobody desires you, but God loves you the way that you are. And so the Bible says he passed by. These words are used so many times in the gospel, I could just pick only a few examples. Think about uh, Matthew, the tax collector. Nobody liked or loved tax collectors. But the Bible says in the gospel of Mark and Matthew that Jesus passed by the booth. And when he saw this brother, he didn't preach to him. He didn't start asking him questions. He simply said to him, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed Jesus. Because when Jesus passes by, the smart thing to do is to follow him. Maybe you're not Matthew, maybe you're Zacchaeus. You're rich, you're wealthy, but you can't enjoy that wealth because nobody likes you. Why? Because you've cheated, you've killed, you've stolen to get what you have. Not only that, you are humpa lumpa, you're short and nobody likes you. But Jesus comes along, looks up to the tree and says, Zacchaeus, come down, I'm coming to your house. Zacchaeus gives away a fourth of what he had. Why? Because Jesus passed by. Maybe you're blind like Bartimaeus, crying by the side of the road, have mercy on me thou son of David. Jesus stops and comes and asks you, what is it that you want? And you say to him, oh, that I might see. And your eyes are opened because when Jesus passes by, you will see things clearly. Amen, somebody. Maybe you are like the disciples in a boat, in a storm, but there's no Jesus asleep in the boat, but he walks on the water because nothing can stop him from passing by. He walks on the water and he comes by and he tells the storm, peace be still, because when Jesus passes by, storms stop. I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, as I'm talking to you right now, I understand that to tell you keep calm and live is not easy, but I want you to know where living begins. Living begins when Jesus passes by, not when problems are fixed. Wait, what do you mean? Let me read the passage for you. The Bible says, as you lay there, I said, live. As the baby, helpless, vulnerable, undesirable, all the negative words you can think of, he says to the baby, live. In the midst of the mess, God says, 
live. Don't wait for things to get better before you smile when you wake up in the morning. Don't wait for the disease to leave your body before you start praising God. Don't wait until there are more zeros on your bank account before you can say God is a giver. Don't wait until you are married to say that Jesus is your lover and your friend. Because in the midst of your struggles, God says, live. It's November, nothing has worked out. You've pretty much given up. The business year is almost over. But God says, you can still live. Without the money, without the people, without the health, you can still live. As long as your heart is beating, you have life in you. How is it possible that there's life in me when things are not good? Because Charles Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon said there's life not in him, talking about you, but in the voice that bids him live. That child could live because God said so. If that child could talk, which would be creepy, but if that child could talk, the child would say, how do I live? I don't even know who my mama is. I don't know who my dad is. I'm all alone by the side of the road. But God doesn't care about your circumstance. He cares that you keep living. Because life begins in the mind and is expressed in the things that you do. There are people who are breathing, but they're not alive. There are people who make a living, but they're not living a life. They are like zombies waking up into the morning, going to a job they don't like, working with people they don't like, earning a salary they know they shouldn't be getting. Uh, you have to smile to the boss and you got to say, hey, uh, I love this job. And when your, 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 your review comes up and you're given 99, you're like, awesome, I get to work here again next year. Yay. And that's your life every day. Wake up, go to work, get stuck in traffic, go to church, listen to the sermon. Go run car free day on Sunday. Monday, back to work. Get in the car, go to work, eat lunch, go home. How was your day, honey? Day was good. Go to bed. Wake up in the morning. Notice, no praying, no devotion, just this routine. Just this routine. And you call that life. But God says, I want you to live. God says, I will help you. God says, I will help you. How does God help you? The text says, you will become, notice he's talking to a woman. Again, I'm sorry, it's in the Bible. He's talking about a girl child. So naturally, there's going to be some developments that are of the female nature. In the text, it says, you will thrive like a plant in the field. You grew up and became a beautiful jewel. Your breasts became full and your body hair grew. The body hair part I don't know what that's about, but this is a girl child. She's developing. She's becoming beautiful. Why? Because God is taking care of her. He's taking care of her. But then the Bible says, you are still naked. Now, please understand, this is an analogy. Don't picture a naked girl by the side of the road not wearing clothes. Don't, don't do that. Focus. Focus. All right? Let's go back to World War II. Let's go back to World War II. Well, one of the things, the reasons they gave that message, keep calm and carry on, is because if you expect bombs to drop and you are planning a wedding, would you still go ahead and get married? If you are planning to do an operation, you know, one of those where you go under for like two or three days, would you still go ahead and do it? If you are planning to take an exam or pursue your studies, would you go ahead and do it? Most people's lives stopped the moment World War II started. People stopped being parents. People stopped being married. Now it was survival of the fittest. And the leaders were saying, you need to keep living. Don't stop your life. Keep living. And I'm saying this to you. Stop allowing your circumstances to halt the plans in your life. I'm going to share two statements and I'm done for today. First one is this. To live is to leave, God says. God knows that even though the baby is by the side of the road, he can say to the child, live. But it's not enough for the baby to stay there. He had to pick up the baby from that situation, wash it off, cut the umbilical cord, and make sure that there's no scratches or scrapes on the baby. Heal it and raise it, feed it, clothe it, take care of it, teach it. Because God understands that in order to live, sometimes you've got to leave your desperate situation. Don't stay there. You know it's not working out for you. Why do you stay there? Please tell me. Why? You hate the job. I've been here for six years. You've hated the job for 10 years. But you're always saying, Pastor, pray for my job. I'm not praying for the job now. I'm praying for you. Pastor, pray for the relationship. No, no, no. I'm praying for you. Pastor, pray for the business. No, I'm praying 
for you. Because if you can start living, your job will not be your life. Your partner that is not treating you well would not be your life. Is pastor saying that you should get divorced? No, he is not. I have been misquoted a thousand times since I've been to this place. So I have to keep doing these commercial breaks. When I say leave, I'm not saying leave your marriage. I'm saying leave the mindset that's making things bad. Sometimes you don't even need to change the job. Sometimes you just need to change the way that you think, the way that you see people, the way that you see yourself. Because in order to live, you have to leave. Amen. Mm -hmm. I, I know y'all. I know y'all. Verse 8. And when I passed by again. So, he passed by with this baby in its own blood. He took that little girl, raised her like his own, and now she's a full-grown woman. And then he notices that she's old enough to fall in love. Now, I would never suggest that a man do what is in the passage, because this is God. But he says to the little girl, you are old enough to get married now. And so God says, I will be your husband. I have taken care of you. I have raised you. And now you're old enough to fall in love. Therefore, I made a covenant with you and you have become mine. So God found the church. He found the Jerusalem by the side of the road. He raised it up and made it a beautiful city. That's why the name Jerusalem means the peaceful city of God. Because Jerusalem is God's wife. He took care of her. He has a right to marry her. He has a right to take care of her. He has a right to give her what he wants. And notice in the text, I'll read the text in a moment, back to World War II. To live is to love. To live is to love. Here's a statement. Do you know that the ability to love in the worst of time is the greatest evidence of living? What does that mean? No matter how much financial troubles you're having as a couple, if you can maintain your love or make it more, you are truly living. Because there are people who don't have money. I'm sorry, there are people with a lot of money, but they're not happy. In fact, every waking moment is a dread for them because they don't like the person they're with. But if you can be loving people more when things are bad, again, sensitive subject, but I've spoken to couples who've gone through the worst tragedies a couple can ever go through. And I say to them that here's the thing. The more love you have for each other, the greater the chances of seeing yourselves through the struggle. One of you loses a parent. You lose a baby. You lose a job. The worst thing you can do is to separate and try to deal with it alone. The best thing you can do is to be there for each other. And so during World War II, one of the things that was happening, like I said, families were breaking apart because sons were going to war. Uh, mothers had to be in hospitals, nursing soldiers that were dead. Fathers had to keep watching somebody come into the door to report that your son has died. So love was difficult. And yet, listen to what Winston Churchill said. Winston Churchill is a prolific man. In fact, he, he had a lot of flaws in his personality. But one of the things that I admire about him was his mind. Winston Churchill became Prime Minister of Britain in, at the age of 65. Older. He wrote more books than Shakespeare. And uh, who's the brother that wrote uh, Oliver Twist? What's his name? Charles Dickens. Winston Churchill wrote more books than Charles Dickens and... William Shakespeare put together. Where did he get the time? Where did he get the time? Because this man was passionate and, uh, and in love. So during, during the times of war, he was asked a question. What is your greatest achievement? When he was prime minister, he was asked, what is your greatest achievement? Somebody else would have said, winning World War II, unifying a nation at its worst time. But his answer was amazing. I hope I can say this when I turn 65. Winston Churchill said, my most brilliant achievement was my ability to be able to persuade my wife to marry me. That's his greatest achievement because for him to be in love was to live. Biogra biographers say that he wasn't the most pleasant person to be around. He was difficult. 
One, one day a woman came to him. Winston Churchill loved to drink a lot. And she came to him and during a party she, she commented about his drinking and said to him, you are destroying your life. And his response to her was, well, I may be drunk right now, but when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to be sober, but you are still going to be ugly. That's the kind of man that he was. But he loved his wife to death. Why? Because in the worst of times, the greatest evidence of living is being able to still love. Don't get caught up with your job. Don't get caught up with your kids. Your kids, some of you, your kids have become your life that you are sick. You don't even remember your husband anymore because of the baby. Husbands, you spend your day at the office because you're raising the college fund. Guess what? When they turn 18, in the context of my culture, they will leave home. Then it's just going to be the two of you. Then what? You send them to college. They've gotten married. They have their own kids. What about your life partner? All those who are married, and I'm happy that my wife is not with me by the stage. All those who are married, turn to your spouse right now. I, I can see you. Turn to your spouse right now and tell her, keep calm and live. Go ahead. I'm watching. I'm looking. <laughs> I never said tell her you love her. I said tell her, keep calm. <laughs> Lord have mercy. God says, I bathed you. I washed off your blood. I rubbed fragrant oils into your skin. I gave you expensive clothing. When you read the rest of the passage, he gave her clothes. He gave her shoes. He gave her everything that she needed. Why? Because she was his bride. He took care of her. Because when you are in a relationship with God, he will provide for your needs. It may not be physical. It may not be things you can touch. It may not be uh, Gucci and Versace and all that kind of stuff. But he will give you the greatest thing you can ever have. That is love. Now, if the story stopped there, ah, we can go home, go to potluck and go about our day. But that's not what happened. Ignore that. It's not supposed to be there. But you thought your fame and beauty were your own. So you gave yourself as a prostitute to every man who came along. Your beauty was theirs for the asking. Verse 33. Look at your Bible. Verse 33. God says, a prostitute gets paid for her services. But you bribed men to sleep with you. Remember, he's not talking about Babylon. He's not talking about Egypt. He's talking about Jerusalem. And his wife that he took on the side of the road as a baby, abandoned, vulnerable, and helpless, raised as his own, married, and took care of, she said, I am way too happy. I don't like happiness. All this attention from God, I do not need it. And so you went on the streets. You didn't prostitute yourself. No, 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 no. You paid men to sleep with you. How do I even begin to make an analogy of spirituality with that kind of language? But this is how fed up God is with Jerusalem. That instead of living a good life, you destroy it by the choices that you make. He says a prostitute is better than you. At least she gets paid. You're losing your youth, your wealth, your reputation, the love of a husband who is God. To go into the world where men make fun of you and take your youth, your wealth, your womanhood, and there's nothing left. And then you come back to God with empty hands and you say to him, why am I miserable? He's talking to the church, he's talking to you, he's talking to me. That in November of 2019, the reason there's an emptiness inside, it's not because you don't have money, it's not because you don't have a job, it's because you've walked away from God. It's not about the status of your life. It's not about money. It's about where you and God are. And so even if you have money, you are unhappy. Even if you are married, you are unhappy. Even if you are healthy and you can jump up and down like a child, you are unhappy still. It's because you have done worse than a prostitute. You've given over everything. And because, let me tell you something, the devil never gives, he takes. The devil never gives. When the devil gives, he gives so that he can take more. He'll give you 10 million so that he leaves you in 100 million debt. He'll put you on the limb of a tree so that when you think everything is good, he'll cut it off from under you. He'll leave you helpless, vulnerable, and undesirable. You don't believe me? Go to a rehab center and speak to the men and women, the young girls, 
celebrities, rich people, poor people, and ask them, how do you feel about yourself? None of them will get up with pride and say, I am special in the eyes of God because their habits have destroyed their self-esteem. They don't feel like a human being anymore because the devil never gives, he takes. God says to live is to leave, to live is to love. Man says, yes, Lord, I agree with you. To live is to leave, and so we leave God. Why? Because God cramps your style. God's not cool. I cannot post a picture of me in church, but I will post a picture of me wearing ghost clothing and Halloween outfits. I'll do that. I will post a Valentine's dinner, but I will not post communion service because my friends think it's not cool. Because people think living is leaving. We'd rather be away from God than with God. Are, 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 you, are you all hearing me? Doesn't this feel like a Halloween sermon? Because I'm killing it right now. We think living is leaving. We think that being without God is cool. No, it's not. Because when your friends walk away, guess what? Those uh, hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram, they don't go to bed with you at night and tell you that you're special. Only your thoughts talk to you. You can swipe and swipe until your fingers are sore. That's not going to validate your life. Only God can. Because he's the one that saw you by the side of the road. He picked you up and nobody else wanted you. He was nice to you when everybody else ignored you. And now that everything is good, you want to be bougie towards God? Uh, for those who are over the age of 50, bougie means proud. Okay. To leave God is to give up more than you're trying to hold on to. Please just soak that in for a second. To leave God is to give up more than you're trying to hold on to. You're trying to hold on to your looks. So you spend all that money on, on products. You're trying to hold on to your, your, your looks, so you spend all that money on clothing. But you don't give nothing to God. God doesn't get your time. He doesn't get your money. He doesn't get your family. He doesn't get your business. And guess what happens at the end? You lose more than you're trying to hold on to. In the book of Nehemiah, it says, you will build and it will crumble down. You will look into your pockets and you'll notice there are holes in them because at the end of the year, you've lost more than you've given to God. Think about it. You are unhealthy. You may be prospering financially, but you've got to keep going to the doctor because you're stressed out. Your blood pressure's up because you're so focused on the dream that you forgot God. Cut them some slack, Pastor. They're trying. They're trying. Verse 16 and 17, you used the lovely things I gave you to make shrines for idols. You took the very jewels and silver ornaments I gave you. You made statues of men and then you worshipped them. All the gifts that the husband gave, the wife took those things and started worshipping them. To live is to love, man says. To live is to love, not God, not your family, your car, your house. Your jewels, your shoes, your phone, your tablet, whether it's a Samsung or an Apple. You love things more than people. Because in our minds, to be alive is to have the nicest stuff in life. I see some of y'all taking pictures with cars that are in the driving lot. You can't go to Mercedes and take a picture and say it's yours. It's not yours. Maybe God will bless you with a Mercedes, but don't develop a Mercedes mind. Amen, somebody. I don't care what you drive, in case you're misunderstanding. I don't care what you drive. I don't care what phone you're using. Just make sure it's not using you. To live God is to love what he has given more than him. People think that living is taking stuff and accumulating it. You can't come for prayer because you got a job so that you can pay your credit card bills. That's not living. That's called slaving. Oh, it gets worse. I'm sorry. It gets worse. God says, Sodom's sins were pride, gluttony, laziness, while the poor and needy suffered outside of her door. Even Samaria did not commit half of your sins. Do you understand what God is saying? Maybe you don't get it. Listen to this. You have done far more detestable things than your sisters ever did. Samaria and Sodom are called the sisters of Jerusalem and God is saying I destroyed Sodom with fire but your sins are worse than Sodom we sit up here in our ivory tower called church we watch people passing outside going upstairs to drink their lattes I know some of you are going to do it after the service is over 
and we say to ourselves, we are better than them because we are worshipping on the Lord's day. Now, you may not smoke weed and drink alcohol, debatable, but you've got so much pride. You treat your maids and your drivers detestably. You treat your workers as if they are your slaves. And yet, you're sober, you're healthy, your blood pressure is low, and you are a vegetarian. <laughs> God says, your sins are worse than Sodom. Sodom is a city where the men wanted to have sex with angels. And God says, you are worse than Sodom. Whew, I don't even know how to recover from that. I want to I wanna share two statements with you. I hope you get them. Living for God means remembering you will die. So you live the best you can knowing you will live forever. I want you to know something that is common to people who are believers and non-believers. The one thing we have in common is all of us will die unless Jesus comes soon. Can we agree on that? All of us are going to die. But the ones who are living for God, remember that they will die. So they make use of their life on this blue ball f- floating through space. They make use of their 70 years, their 80 years, however long you live, making sure that even though I die in the physical, one day I will live forever. Because living for God is truly living. No? Okay, fine. Living for yourself means forgetting you will die. So you live the best you can, knowing you will live no more. Pastor, I want to live the best life I can down here because I'm not sure about this heaven thing. So I'm going to live as much as I can down here because there's nothing after this. Now, statistically speaking, statistically speaking, I'm not saying this because I have a bias towards spirituality and because I'm a pastor, but statistically speaking, the death of somebody who believed in something better and bigger than themselves, their death is more pleasant than somebody who didn't believe in anything. History has proven that. Look at the death of Stalin. Look at the death of Voltaire. Look at the death of the most genius of men that walked amongst us who wrestled with the idea of God. They were not ready to go. How do you die when you've got 50 billion in your bank account? How do you die when you own 10 islands? You've only been to one of them. The other nine, you've never stepped on. And you're in bed, dying of cancer. And you're shaking your fist to the heavens. I want to live. Who's going to take my island? Even in death, people care about stuff. It's been said before, I'll say it again. You cannot take anything to the grave. Except the ugly suit that your family is going to put on you. That's it. That's all you got. To live is to have God. Enjoy your job. Enjoy your studies. Enjoy your relationships. If you drive a Mercedes Benz, oh baby, drive with the top down. You enjoy what you got, but don't forget God. Because without him, 2020 is going to roll up and it's going to be the same thing, same old, same old, same routine, same mess. And then one day, war breaks out. An earthquake rocks everything you have. What are you going to do then? Yet, I will remember the covenant. Amen, somebody. It was dark for a moment there. I was getting worried myself. God says, I I will remember the covenant. You've you've prostituted yourself. You've worshipped the things I gave you. But the one thing I will never do, I'm a faithful husband. I will never forget the vow that I made to you. That in sickness and in health, through thick and thin, through the worst of times and the best of times, I got your back, baby. And God says, if you give me a chance, God comes to you. You've prostituted yourself. And God says, give me a chance. How much more love is that? What more do we need from God? The world keeps taking and taking and taking. Your boss makes you leave work late. Your girlfriend, my brother, she keeps making you spend money you don't have. You don't have money for the cafeteria anymore because she loves you. And yet God says, when you come to me, I'll give you more than you need. So he says... I made you. The covenant I made with you when you were young. I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Listen, true living is making better use of second chances. Here's what I want to tell you about November. The bad news is 
This year is almost over. The good news is a new year is about to begin. Okay, you, you didn't get that. The bad news is this year is almost done. I'm about to turn 13 years old on the 26th of November. That's the bad news. But the good news is Vision 2020. You get to do it all over again. You get to start over with God again. Because living is knowing how to make use of second chances. That's what life means. You failed at being a parent for the first child. Do better with the second one. You didn't serve God the way you should have this year. Do it better next year. You are not the best father. Do better next year. Amen. I'm done. So keep calm. Don't panic. You made bad choices. I understand. But you're here. You're here. You are terrible with people. Your personality is not the best in the world. But keep calm. You're here. Business wasn't that great this year. You've limped on wondering will it all work out. But keep calm. Just keep living. Keep living. Somebody said there are three words that ought to characterize everybody in this room. There's three words that describe the life you should live. Life goes on. That's it. Now the choices you make determine what comes next. So rather than telling you to keep calm in January, I decided to tell you to keep calm in November. Pastor, I want to live. What I'm doing right now is surviving. One day to the next one is just a, it's a pain. I'm happy when it's nighttime because I get to sleep. I'm happy when I'm drunk because I don't get to think about my problems. I'm happy when I'm partying because the music is so loud, I don't have to think about being responsible. I'm happy when I'm eating. Now I'm testifying. I'm happy when I'm eating because I don't have to worry about anything. But when I'm done eating, the gastric kicks in. When you're done partying, you feel guilty and you feel bad. When you're sober in the morning, you got to deal with the same stuff again. You can stay away from home, husbands, but one day you got to come back and face the wife and the kids. So what's the alternative? God says, come to me. Let's reestablish the covenant and let's deal with this stuff together. So keep calm and live. If that's you, rise to your feet. Rise to your feet. In the spirit of Halloween, there's too many people who are walking around like zombies. You're not living. You're told what to do by other people. That's the, that's the state of your life because you're afraid to make your own choices and your own decisions. But God says, keep living. While there are some choices that are against or beyond your control, the one thing that you can choose is to have God in your life. That's a choice that you can make. Whether you're in prison, whether you're stuck in hospital, whether you are in a place where God is not talked about, you can make that choice. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Heavenly Father, as we begin the month of November and as we begin a new series, I pray that we may understand that no matter how dark the past, God always have a, has a solution for the present. And no matter how many times we stray from you, as long as we have our senses to come back, you are always willing to receive us. In fact, you love being with us more than we love being with you. You give us all that we have. The jobs, the houses, the cars, the children, the spouses, the health. That's all from you. I don't care what new age atheistic mind says. Everybody exists because of God. And yet we wander away from you. But thank you for sticking close. Because you always know that one day we will come to our senses and we'll come back again. We've sold ourselves to the world. We've sold ourselves to the mess out there. But you still say to us, come back to me. And I'll establish that covenant with you again. Because to live is to begin with God and to deal with the everyday stuff. And so I pray for somebody here today that they may do their best in the next couple of weeks before the year's over to give ourselves to God. Bless us, Lord, because we cannot bless ourselves. Save us because we cannot save ourselves. Heal us because we cannot heal ourselves. Find us because we cannot find ourselves. Give us strength because we are weak all by ourselves. And most of all, keep loving us because we sure enough can't love ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.